Phew, just in the nick of time. So I'd like to uh, first introduce Peter McMahon, who is the founding director of the Cape Cod Modern House Trust, um, incorporated in 2007 to archive, restore, and celebrate the Outer Cape's outstanding modern architecture and the creative culture that surrounded it. He is co-author of Mid-Century Architecture and Community on the Outer Cape, winner of the Historic New England Book Prize in 2015. It's a beautiful book if you have a chance, and we'll send the link um, for folks to, to purchase the book if you're interested. Uh, Peter's recent lectures include the Architectural Association in London, Harvard's Graduate School of Design, and the Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. His design practice is PM design, focusing on sustainable modern architecture and the restoration of mid 20th century buildings. Our other presenter, our second presenter tonight is Mark Hutger, a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Mark received his bachelor's of architecture from the University of Cincinnati. After working with longtime mentor, John McKee at Sims Manny, <laughs> Manny, I'm sorry, I practice it all day, and McKee Associates in Cambridge. Mark joined Dunn Brady Associates in 1985 on Martha's Vineyard. He purchased the company three years later and has since built into a firm of 60 professionals, now serving the communities of Martha's Vineyard, Cape Cod, and Greater New England. Mark has served on numerous charitable boards, including Island Elderly Housing, Northeastern University School of Architecture Advisory Board, Falmouth Academy Facilities Committee, and the Cape Cod YMCA Facilities Committee. Mark writes and lectures widely. Recent engagements include the Harvard Graduate School of Design, Design Intelligence, AIA Custom Residential Architects Network, and Residential Architect and the Architectural Digest Home Show. So I am going to pass it on to Peter to begin our presentation. And thank you all for being here. We're really uh, blown away by the response to this lecture and we hope you enjoy it. So take it from here, Peter. All right. So, screen share. How Good does job. that look? Perfect. Great, okay. Great, well, thanks to Julie and Amy for having us and um, thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, I think everybody's a little starved for culture at this point. And, um, you know, we've had to cancel our tours and, um, and most of our events. And so it's, it's great to get to people um, digitally. So um, I'm going to um, start a little bit before my a little before my time, but at the end of the last ice age, um, the uh, the glacier that created the Cape, you know, retreated as uh, snow and ice melt melted, and all of the boulders and topsoil went to the islands and the lower Cape, and the outer Cape got just the sand, uh, which has been important uh, important through throughout the history of human habitation. So at least 6,000 years before the Europeans got here, the Wampanoag speaking people were here and their houses were um, basically, I'm, I'm gonna do a very brief discussion of the modernists and how they got here and a little bit about our, um, our programmatic um, efforts with the trust or the modern house trust. So the Wampanoags, um, the Wampanoag buildings are the Wee Twos, which are made of um, cedar saplings, bent and lashed with cedar bark. And um, this is a recently constructed one. Um, these could be very large, up to 40 feet long, and house up to three families. Um, and then they were sheathed on the outside with uh, bark, uh, usually for the winter version, which was back in the woods. And then in the summer, they would move them up toward the shore and those would be made out of uh, mats of reeds. Those were lighter and more, um, would let more air through. So um, 
apparently I, through um, speaking with some of the people that build these recently, these were still being built and occupied as late as the mid 20th century. So there are people who are still alive who partially grew up in, these, in some of these buildings. Um, so this wasn't a tradition which disappeared and had to be reconstructed. This was an ongoing, um, ongoing tradition. So um, the, 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 the Wampanoag buildings introduced some themes which carry on throughout um, the buildings, the modern houses. These buildings were, were a light frame with a sort of light skin hung on that frame. They were um, movable. The skin was demountable. Um, often they would leave the frame and take the skin off and then bring it back seasonally. Um, they were flexible. Um, they could be expanded and contracted. And so there's this, uh, and they were made with readily, readily available materials that were local materials. So as soon as the Europeans got here soon after, they uh, pretty much deforested the Cape and then wood became extremely valuable and um, scarce. So the frequent shipwrecks um, on the ocean side were quickly dismantled and many houses uh, on the Cape have parts of old ships in them. And then of course, a long tradition of moving buildings, either floating them or taking them apart um, the post and beam buildings and moving them. And most houses in Wellfleet um, either have been moved or have a part of another building added onto them. Since the, the, it was very arduous to make um, building parts, uh, that mostly the post and beam buildings were handmade, that the, the wood was very precious and, and had a lot of um, uh, labor associated. So, um, there are these themes on the outer cape of sort of scarcity and functionality and making do with what's available. Also in the mid 20th century, <clears throat> when the modernists got here, there were still a lot of oyster shacks in the harbor in Wellfleet, which were the shacks for unloading your oysters into. Um, and so there is this precedent for these wood, rectangular wood buildings up on piers. Um, so during the depression, late 1930s, Wellfleet was, as you can see, quite deforested. This is the end of Black Pond Road and a little bit of Horse Leech Pond and the Atlantic beyond. So this was um, part of a uh, sort of the wasteland of the, uh, of the ocean side, which was considered worthless land and was being sold for $20 an acre during the depression. So this is part of the 800 acres that was acquired by Jack Phillips's uncle, Dr. Rollins, who was an inventor and a surveyor. And um, often also surveyors often ended up with tons of this land because they would go to survey it and they would just pay the back tax, very small back tax, and, and sometimes ended up owning hundreds of acres. So um, this is all part of the land which became part of the seashore. This is Jack Phillips. He um, was uh, from a, a uh, old Boston family. He had a, one of his ancestors was the first mayor of Boston and um, came to Wellfleet, inherited this 800 acres. He had gone to Harvard undergraduate and he started homesteading on this land and building these sort of temporary structures and inhabiting the land. Um, he had a turkey, turkey um, agricultural growing business. Um, he was an amateur artist. And this is one of his, this is wife number three. I think he was married five times. Um, and this is on the banks of Horse Leech Pond. So he was a, an architecture enthusiast and he had been to Europe and seen early modernism. He started building kind of his own naive version of modern buildings on this land, wherever he thought would be a good spot. This is a, a studio, um, an early painting studio with north facing window. Um, a lot of these buildings are made literally out of driftwood or wood that washed up on the beach and old windows and doors. So there's this very low budget ad hoc um, approach from the beginning. This building 
later fell into the ocean due to erosion. Um, he also bought a bunch, a, a trainload of these flat packed army barracks right after the war. And he would put one of these barracks wherever he thought would be a good spot for a house. Um, this is the house, the Peterson Schlesinger house, the house of Arthur Schlesinger, the historian. Um, and it's still there and it looks exactly the same. So um, the Thorovian idea of the little cabin in the woods. This is Charles Jenks, the famous architect uh, theorist who actually grew up in Wellfleet and in front of one of the barracks. So um, Jack Phillips came in late 30s and then uh, another one of these in the book, we call them the Brahmin Bohemians because they were some from old New England families, but they were sort of uh, roughing it or uh, out, in the, out in the barren wastes of, of Wellfleet. Um, Jack, Jack Hall came to Wellfleet also in the late 30s and bought this old farmhouse, which had been abandoned for decades. Um, and you can see this is Boundbrook Island on the bay side. You can see there's hardly a tree anywhere to be seen. Um, and this was a house from about 1730. He moved in and started actually um, growing things, having livestock. He was also an artist. And um, he collected old barns from around and, and uh, reconstructed them on the property. So this is one theme also of this group of people, especially they really liked real vernacular architecture and they liked modernism and they often did these kind of mashups um, of them. He also had a Rolls Royce, which he used to drive to Provincetown with like 10 people in it. <laughs> um, this is an, the second house he lived in, which was also from the 1730s. And he loved the old buildings, but he didn't have any qualms about blasting giant plate glass windows into them and doing these sort of mashups. Um, and you can see that a lot in the furnishings in these buildings. There's old Hitchcock chairs and then there's Aero Saarinen chairs and they're all just together. I think that makes this sort of a particular vernacular uh, for the Outer Cape. And then um, his great achievement I think is the Hatch House, which um, is a, um, again, in that, in that tradition, it's a very light frame with a skin sort of hung on the frame in a flexible way, um, modular, expandable. Um, these are a lot of the sort of um, uh, treasured ideas of modernism, that buildings be actually changeable and flexible. Um, some interior, so that's the siding you're seeing. So that's the back of the siding. So there, there's not even any studs in the wall. This is superstructure on the outside. And these are just almost like, um, it's almost like fabric or something hung on that superstructure. Um, this is a plan. This building is about 700 square feet of interior space. So it, you know, tiny by today's standards. But there's all this outside space, which is these walkways um, that connect things. And on the far right, you see they added one of the cubes to make that bedroom bigger, following all the same rules. So they um, should, they were, this actually was conceived as a modular prefab, um, although this is the only one that was ever built. And then the shutters uh, raise and lower. And that's, um, so the building is this sort of kinetic structure that's changing all the time with this light and the wind. And um, if you want shade or you want more air, you can raise and lower all these shutters. Um, so this is the second of the houses that we have leased and restored, um, leased from the National Park Service and restored. So, um, Long story short, but the, the, the Kennedys and the Salton Stalls introduced legislation to create the national, um, the Cape Cod National Seashore. In 59, the legislation was introduced. Everybody fought about it for two years. It passed in 61, and there was a total moratorium on new structures um, on, in the building, you could, in the, in the uh, park boundaries. Um, the houses, there were a lot of 
houses that the park had that were built in that two year period and the owners were basically gambling. They lost that gamble when, it, when the park legislation went through and the park generally bought them out and gave them 20 years, at which point they had to vacate and the buildings were supposed to be demolished. So the park, you know, being a bureaucracy never got around to tearing a lot of them down for various reasons, which is lucky because um, this house was was still standing um, when when um, when when I got very interested in this in the, in the early two thousands, and so um, this is what it looked like when we got it. It was in very bad shape. The Hatch family actually had it. Uh, Ruth Hatch lived here till she was ninety three. She was a painter, um, and. We were fortunate to get the contents of this house. The, it's the only house we've restored where we um, got the books, the furniture, the art, the, all the kitchen equipment. So I'm very important uh, to give context to the house that this is, this is all of the um, material that the hatches lived with. And the hatches still stay there in the fall sometimes. A third one of these people was um, Hayden Walling um, who came at age 18 and bought a piece of land from Jack Phillips for a couple of hundred dollars and started building this house with many parts of old buildings. Although the interior is very modern, um, he always used uh, recycled wood. This is the Lachey house by Hayden Walling. He had no training as a carpenter or as an architect, but he taught himself both and he, was, he built all of his own buildings. Uh, this is a studio. A lot of times, uh, a lot of these people were painters or their clients were painters. So there are a lot of these studios around with big north facing glass. Um, so large plate glass wasn't available. So in this case, to be a modernist, you've got to have that big wall of glass. So uh, he just framed a regular stud wall and then he had, he could get strips of plate glass which he actually um, lapped like clabbers to get this effect. The, those windows have been replaced, but basically, if it didn't, if they didn't sell it at Mid Cape Lumber, they, you know, you couldn't. It was not. It was too difficult to get. So no exotic materials. So around this same time, um, uh, in the late, uh, you know, the teens, twenties, thirties in Germany. Um, the Bauhaus was formed. There was just a hundredth hundred anniversary, centennial. 1919 was the founding of the Bauhaus, founded by Walter Gropius. And um, this is the second Bauhaus in Dessau, um, designed by Gropius, uh, basically meant to be a factory for design and art. Um, Gropius had this idea of combining art, craft, and technology in a way that has had enormous ramifications uh, around the world ever since. Um, the Bauhaus was kind of, Gropius collected the most progressive um, people from theater, um, painting, textiles, metalwork, architecture, and for this brief period of time kept it all going until um, 1933. And um, and really, um, the people, the, oh, people always ask me why the flat roofs. This part, one reason is that in Europe, in the early modern um, uh, buildings in Europe, the roof is where you did your gymnastics. So <laughs> the roof was supposed to be a place of sun, you know, sun and exercise. They were obsessed with being outdoors and, and sort of health and, uh, eating wheat germ and all that kind of stuff. The, actually, the Bauhaus, um, when, when you Google Bauhaus, you also get the goth punk band from the 80s, of course, Bauhaus. And the, this, this band definitely, they keyed in on the sort of gothic, spooky side of the Bauhaus, um, which was definitely there, especially the early Bauhaus. These were expressionists, and they were into um, seances and um, mysticism. And there's a great book out now called Haunted Bauhaus that's about sort of um, 
the occult and gender fluidity and um, political extremism at the Bauhaus by Elizabeth Otto. So the youngest uh, student there was Marcel Breuer who arrived at age 18 and um, soon sort of invented tubular steel furniture, became the master of the furniture shop. Here he is in the Vasili chair. And the Cheska chair, which have, it might be the most reproduced chair in the world. You, you find them in a gas station in Bangladesh and, and, and anywhere you go in the world, you'll see these chairs. Uh, but embodies this idea of the Bauhaus of, you, you have the sort of factory made um, high tech part of it, which is the frame combined with the sort of craft part, which is this natural material that's hand wrought and there's this with Breuer, you he you know you there's this constructivist idea that you see how everything is made. You always see the connections. Everything is revealed. Um, so Gropius uh, had an inner circle of friends. Uh, this is Herbert Bayer, Santi Shavinsky, also included uh, Maholi Naj and and Marcel Breuer. So. Um, the, so as I say, the Bauhaus was a very brief period um, and they do get a lot of grief for um, uh, supposedly forcing all the female students to only do textiles. But Elizabeth Otto is actually doing a lot of original uh, primary research on this from the actual records. And it turns out that women were actually much all over the Bauhaus doing all kinds of interesting things, especially photography. This is Mariana Brandt, um, who um, did a lot of amazing photography, which is really just coming to light recently. Um, so a lot of this is really just appearing in the last few years. Um, this is um, Gertrude Arndt, who um, predated Cindy Sherman by uh, <laughs> a, a long time, but was also doing this interesting sort of um, photographing herself in these imaginary historical um, costumes and stuff. And, and these have also just recently come to light. So the Bauhaus was the last version of the Bauhaus. They had to move, uh, they, they had three different places. They, they increasingly right-wing government kept closing various versions. The last version was in Berlin uh, led by Mies van der Rohe and was only an architecture school. And they closed that in 1933. And the whole Bauhaus gang went to London, um, spent a few years, and then all came to uh, Boston area in, in 37 when Harvard hired Gropius to basically replace, replace the uh, Beaux-Arts um, curriculum with a, with, a, with a modified version of the Bauhaus curriculum. So this, they spent the summer of 37 in Marion, Mass, in a rented house. Um, and then Breuer and Gropius went to Harvard and the rest of them spread out, basically teaching the Bauhaus pedagogy all over the US and um, having an enormous impact. This is that summer of 37. This is Zanti Shvinsky, Maholi Naj and Herbert Bayer. Um, and that's Gropius in the middle. Um, that's Mary Barnes, uh, the designer uh, who married Ed Barnes and ran his office with him. They're reenacting uh, Neptune and his sons wrestling the sea serpent. <laughs> um, the first of the Europeans who came to Wellfleet is uh, Serge Chermayev, who's Russian, um, had educated in England and had met the Bauhaus people there. Um, it's his wife, Barbara, uh, his wife, his, his son, Ivan, the great graphic designer. And the smallest one is Peter Chermayev that started Cham Cambridge Seven, uh, Design New England Aquarium. Um, so Serge um, taught at Harvard and Yale and um, Brooklyn College. He started building these sort of experimental studio buildings. Um, there are seven in Wellfleet, which are all still standing, although many have been altered. Again, you have this super light frame with this sort of skin hung on that frame. Um, the, this building was actually expanded by two more bays and then had another sort of L-shaped piece. So there's this modular, modular expandable framework. Actually, he actually would take the window portions out and move them around. So it's this sort of Lego idea. 
It's a larger version. Um, so by the mid 40s, Chermayev, um, and this is Bernard Rodofsky on the left and Juri Kepish on the right who started the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, which has sort of turned into the Media Lab. Um, they were hanging out in Wellfleet and writing books and um, sort of have workshopping various ideas, um, which turned into uh, large. So Rudofsky wrote the book Architecture Without Architects, which was a big show at MoMA and was a very influential book about vernacular architecture. So I think this, you could say this is definitely sort of the hippie end of modernism. They were very interested in vernacular. They were very interested in anti-formalist sort of organic ideas about design. Um, and they were very interested in the user, um, the end user of buildings, not so interested in formalism. Um, this is 1945 Gropius and Zanti and his assistant making kites uh, in Truro. Um, Breuer designed this prototype house, um, which he called the long house, which I think, I haven't found documentation evidence of this, but I think this was influenced by the oyster shacks, this sort of idea of a house up on piers, also related to uh, earlier European modernism with this uh, cantilevered porch, which is sort of hung on cables. There are so that would be the building on the left, uh, which is sort of part that there was a, there are four versions of this house in Wellfleet and um, two of them have this sort of studio addition on the right. So some of them are flipped or mirror images, but basically the idea of this prototype that can be repeated. There's no point in starting from scratch every time. How am I doing for time? Um, you're about 25 in. Okay, so I should go fast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's usually, yeah, we're all riv it's, it's, this is good. Thanks, Peter. Keep it's going. usually a longer lecture. Um, <laughs> so this is one of those houses, the Wise House. Uh, says Breuer at his house in 1950, um, and a view from the deck at his the porch at his house. And this is the living room of his house, which is uh, has some of his sort of furniture made of cement blocks and things from the lumber yard, and um, a sort of like sort of summer brutalism. This house um, is actually kind of the next thing we're interested in, although it's, it's a tricky one. It's a still owned by the family and it is, um, the son has decided to sell it, although he has a crazy price tag on it, but it, it is very intact. It it's, has a lot of deferred maintenance, but Breuer is actually buried there. Um, his ashes are buried and it's filled with his furniture and art and um, could really be as important as the Gropius house, um, if, you know, if it was fully restored and we could um, kind of uh, fold it into our program. The thing is the buildings that we've done so far are all leased from the park. So we've only had to raise the money to restore them and maintain them. In this case, um, this building would need to be purchased um, from the sun. And so this is, um, we are looking for people that would want to be involved in this project uh, with significant donations um, to make this happen. It's, it's a really, it's an opportunity and, and if it's lost, it, it's, it's gone. So, um, you know, it's on a beautiful piece of land, four and a half acres. Um, and for most people, it would be a tear down. It's unheated and it's, um, it's, it's not most people's idea of, of what they want nowadays. This is Zanti Shavinsky um, on the porch um, with Connie Breuer on the right and the woman on the left, I couldn't identify for a long time. And I found her finally still alive in New York, um, Christina Bevington, she was French Senegalese and she worked in Breuer's office. Um, this is Kepish and his wife, Juliette. 
in their house in Cambridge. And this is an illustration by Juliet. She was, uh, did a lot of children's books. This group created a lot of children's books, wrote and illustrated. And we did a show uh, a few years ago at the Historic Society of all the children's books. Um, so Breuer House in Dennis, a high budget Breuer House that actually preceded the Wellfleet ones, which we did finally find. Um, and it's also quite in quite mint condition. Um, Paul Weidlinger was the engineer for Breuer and most of this group. And he came, uh, he did the Want Beinecke Library at Yale and many, many other buildings. Came to Wellfleet to visit Breuer and built this house in 53. And this was the um, third house we restored, uh, which was really a wreck. You can see the right corner, a tree fell on it and it was just kind of right at the edge. Um, but there's a plan. <coughs> um, we finished the restoration about six years ago and um, that's the interior. Um, Charlie Zender was a Korean War uh, Marine in the Korean War, came to Wellfleet and bought a bunch of land. <coughs> he did over 53 houses, including three poured cement um, towers. Also never went to architecture school. The, 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 neither did Breuer technically because he left the Bauhaus before there was architecture curriculum. So the, almost all of these people, the th one thing they have in common is they never actually studied architecture, <laughs> but he was very talented Zender and could draw very well. This is the house I grew up in by Zender. When I was 10, my parents hired him. It's not a good picture of it, but it was a great house. And this was the first house we restored, the Kugel Gips house by Zender. He was a Frank Lloyd Wright fan. You can see the dematerialized corners and um, that's the other side of it. And the plan. Um, and that's the restoration. So we do, um, as part of our program, we do um, tours, house tours. There's actually a lot of modern houses on the Outer Cape and um, we try to include as many as we can. We have conferences. This is at the Tremayev House. Um, we do an artist residency. This is our artist in residence from uh, 2020. There was a poet, two dancers and a painter from New York. And what we do is we pick, uh, we pick a curator and then they pick three other participants and then um, that, that's the group for that year. Um, Cape Cod Modern is sort of the compendium of all of this research. And then the last house that we just finished two years ago was the Kohlberg House. Um, it was actually the worst shape of any house we ever got. And that house is now, um, now finished. <clears throat> that's it. Sorry, I, I hope I didn't go too far over. <laughs> no, that was wonderful. You have a lot of questions, but we'll hold yeah. them to the end. And if people have questions, please um, add them to the chat and I'm gonna collect them and Peter and Mark will answer at the end. We are gonna extend this. It's not going to be a tight hour. Um, so we hope that people will continue to stay on and enjoy the Q&A. So I'm gonna pass it over to Mark. Um, Thank you, Peter. That was so interesting. Um, you got a lot of amazing comments here too. Um, so I am going to spotlight Mr. Hutger there. And the floor is yours. Great, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Great. Well. That was awesome, Peter. Thank you. And you killed it. There were all amazing comments coming up there that uh, they wanted you to keep going. But uh, so I'll try to just kind of take a handoff, uh, like a baton handoff, because what I want to talk about a little bit is uh, my experience uh, actually being educated in the Bauhaus tradition at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, who knew that 
uh, many of the people that were educated by the Bauhaus and immigrated to the United States, as Peter suggested, would end up in this enclave of, of, uh, of Germans in Cincinnati. It was quite an outpost. I didn't know that uh, heading off to college, but I soon found out. But I wanted to just thank uh, Julie and Amy uh, for inviting me to take part in this. And I want to also give a shout out to uh, Peter and the Cape Cod Modern House Trust because he uh, gave us a wonderful, our whole firm uh, was in a bunch of black SUVs going all over the outer Cape. Um, and Peter gave us a tour of about five of these homes. And I have to tell you, it's uh, the work they're doing is extraordinary. And the amount of um, intellect and uh, research that's going behind the, the, the preservation is, is extraordinary. And it's fun to, to hear from a master. So thank you for sharing that. So um, my talk's a little different. Um, my goal, this is me, as my stage name was Trace. Um, our band was uh, Trace and the, uh, the T-Squares. We were contemporaries of David Byrne, Byrne and uh, the Talking Heads, but we were not them, decidedly. Uh, that career went downhill quickly, but I was told, you know, we were pretty good dancers. Uh, I switched to architecture and uh, actually it was sort of all coincident. I put my uh, educational um, goals in front of uh, Robert Deshaun on the left and Mr. Peterson, who was so scary, he never had a first name in, in six years. So these two gentlemen were uh, devotees and educated in the Bauhaus and brought that tradition of education to the University of Cincinnati. And it was a really interesting place to be back in 1976. Um, one of our first projects was, you know, part of the Bauhaus training was to learn empirically by doing, by observing, by seeing the relationships of things. And so the first year was about what I would call empiricism. It was, this was a, an exercise to make these bridges that we actually physically had to walk across. Uh, the studio was really collaborative. There was a lot of back and forth and teaming between different people. And we were always open to sharing ideas. I'd like to point out the curtain wall on the right with the freestanding columns. Again, a modern tenant. This was a, kind of a descendant building right from uh, Dessau. Um, we actually had to put our lives on the line to walk across these bridges. You can tell this was a college-wide event. You can see the peanut gallery down there. And this was done in the high bay space. And uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, drinking involved. And basically, your life depended upon uh, your bridge and how well it was made. You had to wear a bunch of weights to get your weight up. And the person who went across the, uh, the bridge with the highest weight ratio uh, won that year. Every other bridge was burned at a big bonfire as the party continued afterwards. So there was a lot going on uh, at the time. And, you know, I grew up in Indiana on a cornfield and I didn't have any art classes, but, you know, the guidance counselor told me, well, if you're pretty decent at math, you'd probably be a good architect. So I went to school sort of expecting to design buildings, but instead, um, what we started doing is rubbing materials around campus and creating these crazy uh, textures. And, I, and then they said, okay, so now you've collected all these textures, now make a composition. And I was like, this is really abstract. And I was trying to understand where it was going to lead. But uh, keep an eye on what's going to happen with this idea. Uh, we also had to take a six inch cube of redwood and make a composition. You know, this idea of just sort of make a composition without much more program is kind of hard. And when you're just dealing with a chisel, some sandpaper, and a chunk of wood, uh, I don't know. I started thinking a lot about, and I think the critique was all about shade and shadow and symmetry and balance and convex and concave. Again, there were all these empirical lessons about composition that were basically learned by, by making stuff. This project was called the modular and the challenge was to create space. You had to define a cubic foot, 12 by 12 by 12 using three modular units. Well, I bested the challenge by just using two, these L-shaped pieces of walnut and simple pegs uh, of pine for contrast. And the whole idea was to study rhythm and pattern and shadow play. 
and to really consider the idea of modularity, the simplicity and economy of materials. So that was a lot of fun. And then the next project came along and this was how do you define a cube using motion? So this was interesting. This project took me hundreds of hours to make these cuts around these and to polish these up and make these little pivot joints in the mirrored expression here. And while I'm making this, my friend uh, in, in studio, he built a plastic box and put two holes in the edges of it. And when his turn for critique came up, he took silly string on both sides and went psh, filled the cube and defined the space using motion. He got an A, I got an A. But this project here still works. It's sitting on my counter right behind me. And uh, his project was in the trash can by the end of the class. So the beginnings of my sensibility about craft and how to build once well, I think happened early on. Uh, fast forward um, four years, I was so interested in what I was learning at the, you know, about the Bauhaus tradition of learning that I sought out a job at the Architects Collaborative, which was right behind Ben Thompson's famous design research building. And I inserted myself in the middle of the professional uh, realization of a collaborative architectural practice. Uh, and it was great though to have, uh, you know, the design research building, which was what many consider the first lifestyle store in, in America, you know, which he opened in 1969, a very progressive place. I worked in Elkus Manfred, or excuse me, I worked in Howard Elkus's studio at the Architects Collaborative. And he of course split off to, do, to form Elkus Manfredi uh, when the collaborative closed, but that was a wonderful experience. And um, I learned a lot about collaboration, more there about that simplicity and functionality. Uh, it was an amazing experience. So then just fast forward another 30 years uh, to the vineyard. And um, I'm really glad that Peter uh, talked about the uh, geology of where we are and what's happening with the landscape. But of course, the ocean is to the south in this particular situation. I'm on Equina. Um, I also could talk about the Native American uh, influence on what we're looking at and the permanence and the way of sitting in the ground. I'll skip that a little bit, but I want you to focus on the primary dune and then the swale and then the secondary dune because uh, what we were uh, faced with was creating a, a home um, for Dutch clients, we call it the Dunehuis, um, that was to occupy a 1,000 square foot footprint um, that was already existing. And of course, if it hadn't never been there as a fishing shack, it would have never been allowed uh, at this day. It was on the north, south, east, and west, it was limited. It was limited to 18 feet high. The clients were European. She's a furniture designer. They're world travelers. And both of their daughters were surfers and uh, they loved to ride horses up and down the beach. And their vision for a home was a serene home immersed into the natural environment. That was the challenge. And so I thought I'd just explain this house and how some of the things I learned and the progressive uh, thought process of how to think about materials and look for inspiration might in, you know, be imbued in, in architecture that we're, we've done recently. Um, as I said, the existing footprint was already there and, and it was backed on the right side of this sh shot you see is on the north side. There were some taller trees that hid this from the street. Our idea was to stay hidden. And so we used a very low roof form. Um, we're also trying to figure out what language to use here of architecture because the only thing we could see was nature in the whole, the, in, you know, everywhere we look. So it wasn't about a handshake with any architectural language or syntax. It was really about uh, an inspiration that came from the wind, the path of the sun, the vegetation, the topography. And I also forgot to tell you that while I was a singer, I was also a lifeguard. And uh, what I always loved about lifeguard stations is the fact that, you know, they have these shutters that open up and they define a shade pattern around the perimeter. They create a space that's not quite outside, it's not quite inside. And when they're closed down, of course, they protect the uh, occupants and whatever's inside uh, during inclement weather. 
And so I was thinking about the kinds of buildings that archetypal, uh, you know, protect themselves in, in seasons because the client was only going to mostly use this in the uh, early or excuse me, late spring, summer and, and early fall. So I started looking closer at the property. Oh, I forgot to tell you too, I played football and uh, I was free safety. And uh, I was the last line of defense before the other team might score a touchdown. So uh, it was really important that I could read the play and react to the circumstances put in front of me at any given time. Every play was unique. And it kind of, I realized uh, as I've been doing this over the years that I'm still kind of free safety. I'm still reading and reacting. And so when I'm looking around in the property for inspiration, you know, I look at this piece of driftwood and I look at the sands of time and the weather and how it created this beautiful uh, patina on it. And it created that amazing shadow pattern. And, uh, and this mixture of materials looking better, in my opinion, this is really beautiful, you know, and they look better over time. And they also have the marks of the climate upon them uh, are really interesting uh, to me. I think what you could get out of that would be something authentic and, and an empirical expression of material and place. And also looking for inspiration, uh, the clients were asking for a timeless home. They said, I don't want a house that looks like it was made in, you know, 2019. I want a house that kind of has this floating thing. And, you know, Peter showed us a lot of architecture earlier that had that sense of, well, you know, if you didn't see the date on the edge of the Polaroid, you might not know, you know, there, there were decades that separated many of those. And so I believe that when you respond to the things that don't change over time, and when you let those influence the architecture and the interiors of what you're working on, that you will create a more timeless uh, work, living environment. And so keep in mind this, uh, this uh, beautiful sand and, and the different la layers of aggregate here and some of the colors because they become part of the inspiration for this home. Uh, the dune hoose was conceived as a driftwood box. I mentioned that there was a primary uh, uh, dune. And as you walk along the beach, I was really concerned that the, the natives, meaning the islanders who are going back and forth on that beach, when they look over, they don't see a bunch of glare from the windows that give nice views in the summer. And they, you know, in the winter, this thing would be closed up and uh, protected from the winter storms. So basically, uh, and by the way, as architects, we never want to wait uh, for the shingles and the cedar to weather out. So this still has the cedar color, but right now it's this beautiful greeny, silvery gray, and it matches exactly the bark of all the trees around it. But we created these eyelashes. Uh, that move up these shades that protect in the winter and in the summer they open all the way up and they start to become this definer of this porch space on the second level where the living areas are. Um, I think some of the thoughts about motion and defining space uh, by movement were starting to come back from my you know educational career and the architects also mentioned some, or excuse me, the clients also mentioned something up front in, in our early interview about what they wanted, that they wanted the house to work like a Swiss army knife, which I thought was really interesting. So this way of opening and closing was something that I thought really added a dimension to the architecture. And I like the way that the house kind of wakes up in the summer and then it sort of goes to sleep uh, seasonally. And there's something really beautiful about that. And, you know, thanks to Peter, I realized that I'm actually a modernist because he said to be a modernist, you have to have a big wall of glass. So I have a big wall of glass here facing south. So, but the, the key aspect of this, of course, is that it's a very small house. The footprint, as I said before, was 1,000 square feet. So this house is, is just at 2,000 uh, square feet. I like the shadow play uh, that occurs during the path of the sun as it, as it moves from the east, which is on the right-hand side here uh, and comes over to the left-hand side. It makes the house, I think, alive with its shadow play. And here you see that interstitial space. It's not quite outside, it's not quite inside. This picture is taken uh, you know, in early September. So the shade, the pattern from the solstice angle has already started to move the, the, the shadow in a little bit. And of course, 
by the time the sun gets really low at, in, during the, uh, you know, like December, uh, the sunlight will come directly in and warm up the radiant floor on the inside of the house. And like, um, like the hatch house, the uh, side panels, uh, these are barn doors, barn shutters, I should say, that close the whole side of the, on the, this is the west side. The same thing happens on the east side of the house. Uh, again, this is something so that you can control the amount of sun. If you, you know, if you want to tune it down, you just open the sliding door and these slide right over. So you can control that daily if you want, which I think is, again, a really beautiful way to transform the space as you are inhabiting it. This is the north entry facade of the house. And, you know, there's a lot of empirical aspects of building, of course, any home, but the north, you're gonna lose energy and you're not gonna gain as much light. So in this case, fortunately, the view is to the south. So we put all the functional aspects and the private aspects on the north side and let the public open areas be facing the view. Uh, the bronze, and wood uh, uh, entry ramp comes out to greet you right at the uh, parking court. And you ascend the house um, all the way up to the entry portal. And then and only then can you understand the view that is breathtaking and open across the breadth of the horizon line. The house is made of four materials and four materials only. Concrete, which is board formed. So if you look at the base of the building, uh, instead of using pieces of plywood, we used horizontal boards so that the pattern of the board, which has to be made by carpenters on the inside of the form, actually creates a pattern. Um, and again, you know, I was thinking about those rubbings that we were doing, you know, because it, instead of big areas of concrete, it starts to break it down and give a nice scale on top of which sits a driftwood box, as I said before. And, uh, we changed the scale of the uh, spacing above to sort of give the box on the top more shadow play and the wood on the bottom, which you'll see on the other side of the house has butted joints, so it's much smoother. You come up to this beautiful patinaed piece of bronze and then and only then do you focus due south to the beautiful view beyond. This is where I take a breath. So here's this floor plan. I'm glad I left it in because Peter showed floor plans and I think you really start to understand things very quickly when you see it. North is to the bottom of the sheet. You see the ramp up to the entry portal on the left. The space is really one big rectangle, uh, a wall of glass on the east, south and west in the living areas which you see uh, in the middle of the of the building and then on the north side, which is the dark areas surrounding it are the more enclosed private areas of the house. The gray areas represent these boxes that we made on the inside of the house that were made of driftwood. We actually sandblasted wood to create that beautiful pattern that I showed you in the picture that was used for inspiration and we used these four driftwood boxes on the inside to define the spaces between them. So when you walk in, you get a foyer that either looks out through the living room and the breadth of the view beyond, or you can go up this stair uh, with this amazing skylight that's like 14 feet long and, and, and five feet wide that completely opens and creates an aperture to the sky above. Uh, you can see the driftwood uh, walls on the outside were brought to the inside, much like Peter talked about in the Hatch house and also the Gropius house, uh, also where he brought the clapboards from the outside to the inside. This was a tenet of sort of trying to blur the distinction between being in and out. And, uh, and then if you look at the modular stairway, this was something that, again, I was kind of playing off that idea of like, how many ways can I reconfigure a simple element to make an, a beautiful event, such as, you know, again, climbing the stair. And this space is really one room. Uh, it's this piece of uh, walnut that's 24 feet long, harvested in Indiana. There's a bronze base along the, the base of it here. So again, you see the driftwood 
boxes into which are all the functional elements of the house, such as the kitchen, which you see here. In the distance, you, you, you will see in a moment uh, a built-in sofa that supports the living area at the far end, meaning on the west. But in, on the, all on this piece of, of walnut, you see the kitchen sink, which is 36 inches tall, whereas the area you sit at the table is 30 inches tall. So this whole idea is that one room has one giant table that facilitates most of the family's activities. Uh, the floor is also, as again, I said, there's concrete uh, here and it's a radiant floor. So it's this beautiful, warm ambiance um, any time of year. The uh, window wall is made of bronze and uh, glass, of course, uh, sliding, lift and slide doors. And then we have these diaphanous curtains that, that come and close this. So in the evening, uh, the reflections that would normally be there from the interior light become this soft uh, ambiance that gives a really interesting aspect to the room in the evening as well. And you know, reflect, you know, when you're reflecting on the nature of nature, um, you know, you can't help but stumble on these cohogs, you know, all along the way. And speaking of Native Americans, as, as we all know, uh, the wampum is the purple part and the darker, the better. And uh, that was representative of uh, trade materials that they traded as well. So we really enjoyed that. And the, the client really wanted a, a feature color uh, in her house. So we just kind of made that contextual connection as well. Uh, and uh, I forgot, I, I insisted on the Albers pillow there for the sake of uh, the Bauhaus, right? Because he was part of that educational system in the graphics department. But in any case, I think this is a good expression of how simple this house really is. You know, you see these very simple uh, driftwood boxes into which these uh, functional elements are in one big room, which is half in and half out. And uh, the powder room uh, is also in one of these driftwood boxes. We wanted this watery mother of pearl wall that we put uh, uh, backlit with, uh, you know, side lights that came in on either side, you know, a bronze sink uh, that comes down and just holds on to this beautiful little cabinet below for towels and so forth. Um, you know, again, I could do a, I could do a rubbing on trace here and make a composition of those just, just sort of getting the texture of the house. You can really feel this house. And you remember the surfing daughters. Well, they have a bathroom on the ground level that walks out. They actually walk through the shower out to the beach with their surfboards and they come back to the house and they can walk through their shower rinse off on the way as they come back to their bedrooms which i thought was a lot of fun again a manifestation of kind of the life patterns of of the particular uh, homeowners and on the east side of the house right under the entry which i love the irony that the sacred and the profane are right next to one another but uh, you start to get to experience the shadow play on the east they all work out in the morning. They love to surf in the morning. He's a runner, she's a biker. And so they wanted this beautiful light filled morning experience on the east side of the house. And so all the textures that are available, uh, including remember I told you to look at that gravelly uh, part of the beach, we sifted, nobody heard this from me, but we sifted a little bit uh, from the beach and, and brought it up and uh, used the larger aggregate uh, to float around the bluestone. So that this is a completely indigenous kind of experience uh, overall. And we hope that the materials are looking better as they're aging. And the animation of the house is all about its movement, the movement of the path of the sun, changing the patterns of the shadows at any given moment on any given day. And if you really dial in and look at this house from a texture and from a, a, a sort of a placemaking point of view, uh, it's very experiential, which is what we hoped it would be. And then you come up the stair through the skylight I already described. Here again is some of the, the, that play of the modular components that I was studying back in 1976. And you find this unbelievable place of refuge up here where the roof deck actually rolls up to become its own dune into which a bronze uh, tub and a 16 foot chaise where all they can all come up 
lie down and stargaze. Because as you know, there's no uh, light pollution out there in Aquana and it's the most extraordinary meteor shows out there. And you can start to see how the house and the landscape start to blend together. And this is looking east in the afternoon with the sun behind us, a serene space immersed, immersed in the natural environment. And I just think it's an example of looking out and looking in. I think a pretty good example of building once well. And we tried for a home that ultimately was about form and function and family. And really something that created a sense of place which are all themes that we work on with each of our, each of our projects. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for having me. Uh, Peter, I mean, Mark, can we have a field trip to this house one of these days? This is just stunning. <laughs> well, you know, what's amazing, um, thank you. Um, we had the great, um, I, I don't know, everything we do is a stewardship proposition, right? Because it's gonna be on the planet for a long time. So we need to make it well, and it needs to have a narrative that connects with where it is and for who it was made. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that, you know, we've been doing this for 35 years and uh, we have catalog that over 90% of the homes we've designed for, for, for our clients are still in the families that we design them for some on the third generation of ownership. And so it's a really interesting thing about dialing in and getting the particular, when you, when you connect it to the place in a, in, a, in a way that people understand, it starts to add meaning to their experience in it. And that's what we tried to do here. Yeah, I love the connection between both of your presentations um, and seeing it, you know, a modern contemporary family now living um, kind of similar with des simple design concepts. It's really um, incredible. You're, you both have received some really nice um, remarks. This one in particular, what a duet of genius, Peter and Mark, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of questions here. Um, I'll start since we just saw Mark's house. It says, beautiful, just curious if the lower level of this house could be built now with the current flood uh, plane restrictions. I'm curious about that too. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, uh, we're in that second dune level and we're well above the uh, floodplain elevation. So that isn't an issue, depending upon how bad global warming gets. So, but so far we're, we're well above that. Excellent. Um, and then um, Peter, Where are these houses, um, or were these houses with framework and skin wall seasonal or winterized? This was back to your presentation. Oh. Okay. I'm off mute. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, can you ask that again? Oh, were they winterized? Yeah, the ones with the, the framework with skin mm -hmm. uh, walls and season, uh, wall seasonal or winterized. Um, mostly seasonal. Um, these, these are largely unheated um, summer houses and some of them um, very um, almost theoretical buildings, you know, they're <laughs> almost uh, conceptual buildings. Um, the Weidlinger house did have heat, although it was a big kerosene thing that, you know, some of them were sort of three season, but, um, and that's one of our challenges is actually to sort of, when we do the restorations, we have to follow the Secretary of State guidelines um, on historic buildings. So, but of course we want them to perform, you know, better. Um, so that all has to be hidden, but we do insulate and, um, you know, make them more waterproof. And in some cases introduce heating and cooling um, so, for instance, the Kohlberg house with the last one we did is on a bluff right on the Atlantic, a very tall bluff with absolutely no protection looking at the north e northeast. So it just gets blasted. Um, and that house we built in a very tight um, way and, and it's um, 
it looks exactly like it did, but it's actually extremely tight and um, well insulated and heated and it's very comfortable all year round. The hatch house, there's no way to do that. Aside from building a dome around it, there's no way to uh, do it because there's no wall cavity. So there's nowhere to put insulation. There's no, you know, it's it, what you see is what you get, mm -hmm. which is part of the beauty of it. it it's a really uh, uh, very poetic structure. And one problem today in, with face, the face architects is we have these very stringent wind um, guidelines, the same wind zone as uh, Dade County, Florida. So there's all of this clunkiness and hardware and massiveness that has to, you, you really have to tie the building down. And um, it's very challenging to introduce any kind of lightness to buildings. Um, it's not impossible, but it's challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also a fascination with uh, Brewer being buried under um, the house, or I'm assuming under it um, and not in the walls. <laughs> no, no, it's, um, it's out in front of the house. There's a, there's a stone slab that he brought from Japan um, that was part of a sculpture. Um, and his ashes and his wife's ashes and her brother, her sister and her husband's ashes are all under this slab. Um, in front of the house, yeah. And the connection is, is, was he the architect for that house? That was his house. His house, yeah. Yeah, still owned by his son. So that was, so Breuer, one of the four houses he did in Wellfleet was his own house. And actually um, went there every summer his whole life, yeah. And this is a, this is a good question um, and for either one of you. Um, you might have seen it if you're in the chat. Can one of you talk about the wealth gap in our country and the impact this is having on home ownership and featured creative architecture on the Lower Cape? Um, I know that there's a, a, a broad spectrum, right? Sometimes I think, I mean, when I, I read that, I think, you know, some of the, um, it, it might be a, a less expensive option to build a small and simple and you know, with four materials, uh, but do you guys have a, a comment or want to comment on that? I, I think we, we already handled climate change so we could handle um, the income inequality now. But, um, you know, the house, the modern houses were built by adjunct professors, you know, for very small amounts of money. Land was very cheap, building was very cheap, and the buildings were very small. Um, and so you could do experimental things and not worry about a big mortgage and will the bank be able to, you know, will the bank agree to building a, an experimental uh, house and, um, and some of them were actually built by the owners, you know, over, over periods of time. Mm -hmm. So um, I think everybody knows the Cape has an absolutely critical affordable housing problem. And it's really affecting the ability to build out here because there are just, there's so few people um, to go into the trades. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, uh, and the pandemic has only, has increased lumber prices from 50 to 100%. There's, mm -hmm. you know, shortages of everything, appliances. And so, um, yeah, we're definitely, we're reaching a tipping point here with 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 housing and that's it just particularly cute on the cape and and you know these were artist communities who you know artist communities you know migrate to places that are cheap and then they become gentrified and they have to move but you know where would they where would these people be going today you know detroit i don't know <laughs> some place where artists go to uh you know, where they can have space to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on that note, um, you know, it, it's so interesting um, to hear about, you know, the school um, that reflect the values of, of Bauhaus. And I'm curious, uh, do those groupings of architects and designers and artists exist today? Is there a next movement of, um, 
of design. I think of them as creative uh, and artists more than thinking of them as architects. Um, but it, does that exist today? I think so. I think uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of regionalists who have really looked at this vernacular theme and really looked and dug into the particulars of place. I can think of like uh, Brian McKay Lyons up in Nova Scotia or Marlon Blackwell in, in Fayetteville who, was, who got the gold medal in, in, in the architecture uh, last year or Rick Joy in Arizona. Um, you know, James Cutler up in, in, in Seattle. These are all people whose architecture is uh, wonderfully conceptual. And what binds them is the deep passion and connection to the narrative of place where they are. For instance, McKay Lyons started his career just building these little fishing shacks, you know, and, and their relationship to one another. And then as uh, his, he got to do, you know, more projects, uh, they became more deeply entwined into the poetry of the landscape. And so I believe that there's a lot of architects practicing regionally who are, who are doing unbelievably powerful work um, where they are. Lake Flato in, uh, in Texas, for instance, in Austin. So there's any number of regionalist firms. And, you know, they tend to be firms you know, our firm is a large firm for a residential practice, frankly, uh, but a lot of these firms end up being, you know, a dozen to two dozen people. And a lot of times there's an educational, uh, all the people I just talked to teach, you know, at a university. Uh, and uh, so there's a theoretical proposition in their work as there is to everything Peter showed today, um, as well as an empirical aspect to it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I wouldn't mind going back to the last question because I've been asked this a couple of times and uh, the issue of diversity is really interesting. You know, we spend a lot of times talking to our clients about where they are and why they're building into the community they want to build into. Of course, the natural environment is a big pull. The community of architecture is a real interest that most people have, you know, and, but, you know, Years ago, I went to Gannon and Benjamin to watch them launch one of their schooners. And uh, they did this thing, you know, where they invited, I think they told the owner that commissioned the boat that they had to have this party. I think they told them that because you're going to, you're not going to understand it, but you need to have this party. And they launched the boat, you know, there's a christening, but the cool thing is it's a potluck and the ship's corker is there and the person that made the cushions and the varnisher and the, can the, the person that made the sails and the rope person, the person that made the bronze fittings, the whole team that came together to, to build this. And I just remember overhearing a conversation the people who commissioned this boat going, I had no idea this much of the community contributed to this boat. And we try to make our clients understand that, uh, you know, you know, you are taking a lot of energy out of our community by building in it. And so we're going to help you look at our community and find ways to be stewards in it. So we do our own work as being partners, as you heard many of the organizations that we find ourselves as principals in our firms being involved in, we try to demonstrate participating in the community, but we often make sure that our clients are well aware of these efforts and support them uh, in a stewardship type way so that they understand how the community works in the give take relationship. Uh, and I think that's really helpful to them because, you know, uh, for instance, last year, we, uh, we got all of our clients memberships in the new Martha's Vineyard Museum over there so that they could become and understand the heritage of this place and perhaps support uh, the heritage of our community moving forward. So that's how we think about it. And we try to get our clients to understand where they are and that they need to be part of it in more ways than just coming and enjoying uh, their home. Hmm. I appreciate that as a nonprofit person, uh, you connecting people with, um, you know, community uh, cultural offerings like that. That's, I think that's a great idea. Um, for Peter, what are, what, do you have an upcoming, you mentioned your, the restoration project um, 
anything on deck, you know, that you're working on beyond that? Um, we're mostly um, focusing on the artist residency and then possibly on the Breuer House project, but that the Breuer would be a real departure for us because it's it's actually a privately owned building that um, is is worth a lot of money. <laughs> and what we've what we've done, what's been possible so far, is actually because there's this very unusual situation where there there are these buildings, really interesting buildings in mm -hmm. a spectacular preserved location that are available to be leased and restored. Once, once we develop the relationship with the park and with the town, who's been our major funder through Community Preservation Act. Mm -hmm. um, but once we kind of made that case that these buildings were important and you know, made this sort of three-legged stool of us, the park and the town, and then um, we have a building built-in business model because we, when the buildings are finished, we rent them to architecture fans, modernism fans, and so we have this very, um, you know, clear relationship with our fans because they come and stay in the buildings, and that supports the whole project. And then that creates a bit of extra money that goes into the next project, but we don't have millions of dollars to put into acquiring uh, you know, new projects. So we're, we're pretty, um, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot done in a fairly short amount of time, but it's be really because this is a very unusual situation. Um, and you know, it would, in a place where land is so, so valuable um, to mm -hmm. have been able to do this. And so um, anyway, that's something we're we're sort of exploring and very interested in. In the meantime, we have taken the art of, out of the house and had it conserved. It's a very important art collection. And we are documenting the furniture and we're doing all the work around sort of archiving and documenting what's there. And hopefully having the house make a transition to uh, to some situation where it will be preserved. So that's kind of, we have been thinking a lot about that. And I know the private um, uh, part of that doesn't need fundraising, but how could people support the Modern House Trust? Just, I, we Thank you, Dominic, for putting that out there. Uh, <laughs> he's curious how he can help um, fundraise for your efforts. Well, I can um, the two of you later too. <laughs> what's that? I can also, I know Dominic, so I could connect the two of you after. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we're sort of, um, we're not doing a lot of public things right now, but we hope to pick up again with tours and events. And I would say just follow, you know, we're not actively fundraising for the Breuer House yet because we need to sort of have a deal on the table. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say just, um, you know, um, go to our website and um, get on our mailing list and just keep an eye on things um, as they develop. Um, you can get copies of my book, Cape Cod Modern, signed copies on the site. And that's kind of a good, uh, for the background of the whole backstory of how this all, not the 20 minute version, but the everything you ever wanted to know about the subject. <laughs> And um, yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful book. It really is. So we'll um, send the link along. So we're, we should wrap up. Um, we've kept everybody here for uh, an hour and 26 minutes. And I appreciate um, all of you for joining us and for Peter and Mark. We're really um, just so impressed with your knowledge and your passion and commitment. Um, to making the world just a, a, you know, a more beautiful place. So thank you for that. Um, any parting words from either one of you? <laughs> well, it was fun. And I thought it, this, it was really funny how uh, someone, I saw a chat on there that said the lectures worked pretty well together. And that was by kind of pure luck, but there is a continuum and it's a strong idea, you know, that influences, uh, a, a wonderful lineage and uh, 
-hmm. So you can, I hope, I hope everybody could connect the dots and follow the themes. That's what we tried to do. And it was a lot of fun. Peter, you did a great job. Thank you for that history. It was wonderful and keep up thank the good work. Yeah, thank you. I just say stay well and get your vaccine. And yeah, here's to 2021. <laughs> yes, thank absolutely. You all. Absolutely. So um, again, thank you to Peter McMahon and Mark Hutker for joining us tonight. Um, our next lecture is called Imagine the Unimagined with Lisa Tung, the Executive Director of the MAM, uh, the newest contemporary art museum at Mass College of Art and Design in Boston, which I think really relates very well to what we're talking about here. Um, we will send a follow-up link tomorrow with um, dates of upcoming lectures and activities produced by the Arts Foundation of Cape Cod. And for now, thank you for joining us. And I'll repeat what Peter said, stay well, get vaccinated <laughs> and enjoy our local culture. So good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Peter, I'm gonna name my next band the Mashups, by the way, that's a pretty cool <laughs> term. Yeah, good. <laughs> I'll play bass. Yeah, okay. I'll sing. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.